Thank you all for joining us. My name is William Berg. I'm president of the Board of Directors of Preservation Sacramento, and we are a 501c4 nonprofit. We're, and we so contributions aren't tax deductible. There are certain advantages to being a 501c4, such as the unlimited ability to lobby. Not that we do a lot of that, but we, we do what we can. And we, as a citywide organization, are focused on protecting historic resources throughout the city of Sacramento. That's our organizational focus. Occasionally we will weigh in on things that are happening at the county and because of our, our lobbying ability, we do a certain amount of lobbying at the state capitol and affecting California law. Today's agenda begins with uh, an introduction of the city of Sacramento's preservation director who will provide updates about what the city is doing. And then we'll do some organizational updates of what we're doing as an organization, some of the things that we're planning for the, the rest of the year and some most of our most recent activity. Then we'll hear from Alexa Roberts of Belvedere Preservation Alliance, who, which is a new preservation organization based in Roseville. Then we'll hear from Doug Bojack um, talking about a plan to add more trees to say Joseph's Catholic Cemetery along 21st Street and, or um, south of Broadway. Then Louis Sumter will give us an update about this year's virtual home tour coming up in October. And finally, we will have the results of the, the survey that we put out and you will get to vote in our poll on Sacramento's most endangered places. We're doing some updates to our website and we stumbled across the realization that we need to update it. So we asked you for some recommendations and then this will be the, the place to turn those recommendations into a list that we'll post online. And, and at any time, if you have questions, you can raise your hand or enter a question into the chat or in Q&A, and we'll try to, to get to them as we can. Generally, we'll wait for the presenter to finish speaking, and then we'll uh, answer Q&A. But if there's any really dynamic questions, just go ahead and post them, and we'll do what we can to moderate. So our First speaker on the agenda, uh, I've known for about, I think, 11 years or 12 years, I think 2009. And uh, I first uh, met Sean when he was an intern for the city of Sacramento. At the time, we were both graduate students in the public history program at Sacramento State. And Sean was interning for the, for the city of Sacramento, and he helped get the National Register nomination for the the PG&E powerhouse along Jaboom Street into shape. And that uh, was a very long project with a, a lot of moving parts, but we're seeing the end result because as actually as I was coming back down, was out of town and came back to Sacramento uh, on Thursday, we saw that there is a now open sign in front of the MOSAC, the Museum of Science and Curiosity, located in the PG&E powerhouse. So since that time, Sean has also worked on the uh, restoration of the Library and Courts building in, uh, next to the state capitol and worked at the California Office of Historic Preservation and uh, California Energy Commission, right? That's and right, yeah. Thank you. And then Sean also served on the Board of Directors of Preservation Sacramento uh, as an uh, ad hoc board member and as vice president until he got snapped up by the city of Sacramento as a preservation planner. And so we're very glad to have a highly qualified preservation director, uh, Carson Anderson, also enormously qualified, just recently retired, and Sean was selected to take over his position. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Sean DeCourcy, Preservation Director of the City of Sacramento, to give us an update about what's happening in the city. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, that was a great introduction. I, was, I had uh, planned to give a little bit of my background, but that pretty pretty well sums it up. Um, I guess the only other thing I'd add is I uh, was origin I'm originally from the Santa Cruz Mountains area, uh, Ben Lomond, is where I grew up. But I've been, I was just thinking this morning, I've been in Sacramento 20 years uh, as of 2021. So I lived in Sacramento longer than I've lived anywhere else. So um, not sure if that makes me uh, a Sacramentan quite yet, but uh, but it's certainly, certainly on my way. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and go through some of the updates of what we've been working on in the, uh, in the preservation department. Um, just bear with me while I do that. Uh, let me If I can manage this without a major technical glitch. All 
All right, there. So you should be seeing my screen now. <laughs> um, so first, we had a preservation commission meeting this this uh, past Wednesday. It was a, a interesting meeting, and we had two landmarks that have been recommended to the city council. The first is 2681 Montgomery Way that you should be seeing here. It's also known as the Chim Havine House. Um, the property owners uh, retain the services of historic environment consultants, Don Cox and Paula Bogosian to evaluate the property. Um, this building is a good example of a Spanish colonial revival architectural style of this period, um, the 1920s. And the design is of one of a prominent architectural firm uh, run by Charles and James Dean, also known as Dean and Dean. Um, they design buildings such as the Memorial Auditorium. Um, they're very prominent designers. And this street, this block of Montgomery Way in Curtis Park has uh, probably the highest concentration of Dean and Dean designed residences of anywhere in the city. It's a very unique place. And we're actually in the process. We have um, five other property owners who are interested in having their buildings listed as individual landmarks. And so we will probably be bringing landmark nominations for those forward in the coming months um, as, as our staffing allows. But um, we were hoping to get them on next month, but we just were not able to, to muster the resources at this time. So we'll, we'll have those coming forward. So next, um, this property is uh, at 2131 Q Street. It's also known as the Beehive Building or McClatchy Center. It's directly across the street from the Sacramento Bee headquarters building. Um, this building has an extremely unique history in that it, was, it represents a period from 1950s and early 1960s when women played a vital role in society and were often engaged in important social activism after World War II. These groups helped inspire movements that led to immense social change uh, in later decades. The design of the building is an exaggerated modern commercial building with gooey inspired elements. This type of architecture developed uh, after the war at a time of technological innovation, space travel, and the post-war cultural obsession with the automobile. Um, this building has actually been proposed for demolition and as part of our, our process at the city, any building that's over 50 years old will evaluate it to determine if it's, if it's potentially eligible for listing. And with this building, we, um, the, there was a historic evaluation done by the property owners that, that said the building was not eligible, but the former preservation director, Anderson, reviewed, um, reviewed the nomination and we circulated it to Preservation Sacramento and the Art Deco Society and Sacramento Modern who all cited um, flaws in the analysis. So staff at the city, myself and, and one of our interns who I'll discuss a little later, uh, Lena Filber, prepared a, a historic evaluation of our own and the uh, preservation director ultimately determined the building was likely eligible for listing. Um, and specifically related to this, this um, it was a training center for home economics for housewives, but then also served as an important um, networking center so that um, those women could form you know, social connection that they weren't finding out in the suburbs, the newly constructed suburbs uh, surrounding Sacramento. So it has an important cultural connection, especially with Eleanor McClatchy, who really saw this as a, as a social gathering place for, for women in the period. Um, so we're, the Preservation Commission reviewed this and recommended it to the City Council. So we'll go to the City Council, it looks like in October, um, for, for a hearing on this item. So we'll see uh, what city, how City Council uh, comes down on it. Um, next, we have some exciting uh, grants. Sorry about the fuzzy photo here. This is just a, sort of to give you an example of, of what this grant involves. So we have a, we're a certified local government, which means we're, we, um, among other things, we, can apply for grants that are federal grants handed through or managed through the uh, State Office of Historic Preservation. And we have received, we're grant recipients for a public outreach and communications uh, update grant. And we, the, the grant generally involves, um, we're, we're hired consultants who are preparing a postcard for mailing to all property owners of historic buildings in the city. And 
we're um, we're going to produce several instructional videos uh, for developers and realtors and um, and property owners of historic buildings, as well as school children, to talk about the the important aspects of historic preservation. The consultant we've selected is uh, called Goodside. They're out of Southern California, and they will they they're uh, have started on the project already. And we have a fairly quick turnaround, so we expect this grant to be wrapping up uh, in the next two months and starting to uh, have some of those final uh, videos and the, and the postcard mailer that we'll be sending out. So it's, uh, it's, and they're also going to be reviewing our website and social media platforms to make some recommendations on how we can better use those, those, uh, those elements. Next, we uh, have another certified local government grant. It's a small grant uh, that involves the National Alliance for Preservation Commissioner um, training program. It's called CAMP. And we will be hosting a, a preservation uh, training. And so you can mark your calendars for this. It's October 21st and 22nd. And despite the photo, it's an online training given our current uh, current circumstances with COVID, but um, we'll be hosting an online training. It's largely focused on preservation commission and how to be a more effective commissioner. So it's really targeted to not just ours, but the region's uh, preservation and planning commissions to, uh, to train them on evaluating projects and, uh, and how to run a meeting, but um, it should be interesting. I've taken a couple of these camp trainings in my career and they're always very interesting and, and, and rewarding. So we'll be coordinating with uh, the Office of Historic Preservation and the National Alliance for Preservation Commissions to, to host this training. So it's a small grant, um, just $10,000 mostly to pay the, uh, the trainers that would be brought on and then some other, some other uh, staff expenses, but it uh, should be a good training. <laughs> so uh, this last grant is, very exciting. You may have seen announcements in the press. The press sort of got ahead of uh, us and where we are in terms of getting the project uh, rolled out. But we've, we've been awarded a grant from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. So the National Trust awarded the city $50,000 to prepare a thematic historic context statement and a historic resources survey uh, geographically limited to identify significant people, cultural history, and places associated with the African American experience in Sacramento from the city's early history through the recent past. We're partnering with Sacramento State history students at both the graduate and undergraduate level to assist with the project. So that should really help us bridge the gap between what we want to do and the $50,000, which is a fairly small amount for um, this year long project. And we've identified several key community groups to help with our outreach, including Preservation Sacramento and Sacramento Modern, but also some neighborhood associations like the Oak Park Neighborhood Association, the Sacramento Black Chamber of Commerce, um, the Sojourner Truth uh, African Heritage Museum. And we're, we're partnering with these groups to really help identify some important community leaders and informal historians that will be that will be part of the project. So we have a oral history component where the students will be conducting and documenting oral histories to, um, to that will be then be housed in local repositories, including the Center for Sacramento History, but neighborhood centers uh, such as libraries or um, the museum, the African American Museum um, in in South Sacramento. So it's a really exciting project. We're, um, uh, we're sort of, we're, we're a little bit short staffed with Carson's leaving and, and my uh, promotion. And so we're, we're really trying to get uh, ahead of on this one. So we're meeting with the faculty at Sacramento State to, um, to get their curriculum ready for when this project does roll out. And their students have, it needs to be incorporated in their students curriculum right away. So we're, we're, um, in, we're undergoing that process and then we'll release an RFP hopefully in the next month or two to uh, bring our consultant on board to assist. Next, um, so the Mills Act program, this is an update about the Mills Act. We have Mills Act program in Sacramento. Owners of historic properties can enter into a contract with the city 
and they agree to maintain or restore their historic property and in exchange receive um, a property tax calculation by the county assessor that will reduce their, will hopefully reduce their property taxes. Um, and so the, uh, the, we have three contracts going forward to city council for approval. Um, the first, and I'll just go from left to right here. So the first is 3135 D Street. This is also known as a Glisto family residence in East Sacramento. It's Italian uh, asparagus farmers that were uh, active in East Sacramento in, prior to being annexed by the city in 1911. These, um, these farmers played a prominent role in, in the area around McKinley Park. Um, they, owned a, they owned a vast tract of land there that they farmed. And it's actually a recent landmark that was listed a few months ago by the city council as a, uh, one of our newest landmarks. And it's a very beautiful uh, building, as you can see. So the, then the, the next building in the middle, you probably recognize this is the Joan Didion House in uh, Poverty Ridge Historic District, a uh, very prominent landmark that was on the Preservation Sacramento Home Tour a few years ago when uh, Poverty Ridge was uh, was a neighborhood. And this house uh, has, a, has changed hands several times in the last few years, but hopefully this new property owner uh, with the Mills Act will, will help them um, to with a lot of the deferred maintenance that has occurred over the transition from property owners. And then the final building is at uh, 15th and F. And this building is on the corner of 15th and F and it um, was recently the subject of a uh, renovation project that raised the building slightly and converted the first floor into the second unit. So it's now a duplex and uh, while preserving the important features of the Delta high water uh, Queen Anne style that, it, that it's very, very classic Sacramento. Um, and this building also has a new property owner. And uh, again, hopefully this, this new property owner will be assisted by uh, the Mills Act contract. So those go, those go next week to city council, um, or I'm sorry, those go next two weeks to city council. And uh, I, they're on consent, so I don't expect uh, any fireworks there. So they should be approved with, with no objections. <laughs> next, I sent out a, um, an email to some key stakeholders yesterday, and you'll probably see this as an announcement, or hopefully you'll see this as an announcement from Preservation Sacramento for their broad uh, community outreach. But if you, uh, if you, if you or anyone you know meets the qualifications that I'm about to uh, tell you, and hopefully Preservation Sacramento will circulate, um, we have three vacancies on the Preservation Commission that will one that's currently vacant, um, and one and two that will be becoming vacant in the, uh, in the weeks to come, I'm sorry, in the year to come. Um, but please uh, consider submitting your applications if you meet any of these qualifications. So the first position is an individual who is a licensed contractor who has training or experience in restoration of historic properties. And this position, um, like I said, will be come vacant in the in the next year, but you can submit your applications now. So the, the announcement includes a link and um, you can go ahead and apply online. And it's managed by the clerk's office, but it's an administrative process that, uh, that uh, I hope you'll consider. If you, if you meet the qualifications as a licensed contractor, I hope you'll apply for that position. Um, the next position is a landscape architect, designer, or historian with experience in historical landscapes. Um, this uh, position was vacated by Karu Brown, who served for a number of years. Uh, she's, she's on the left of the, uh, of the picture here. And um, Karu uh, has taken another job, so she had to actually vacate the position. So we are down one commissioner. Um, and so we're looking to fill this position as soon as possible. Um, so again, it's not just a landscape architect, but a designer or a historian with experience uh, dealing with landscapes. Um, and then the last seat that will be coming vacant in 2022 is an at-large member who shall be a city resident or the owner of a business located in the city with a preference for an individual with training or experience in historic preservation or urban planning. So this is an at-large position and it's uh, fairly broad uh, experience requirements. So again, a city resident uh, or business owner within the city um, with a preference for uh, somebody with training and experience in this sort of preservation or urban planning, but again, not necessarily a requirement. So um, 
it, please consider applying if you, uh, if you meet those criteria. And then I wanted to say a few words about our current staffing. So uh, Carson Anderson on the left is of the, the group here, um, he has recently retired, as Bill mentioned. Um, and so then with my promotion, we're trying to fill our preservation planner position. So we do have an existing list of planners who have applied that will be, um, that we found some qualified candidates. So first we need to interview off that list and exhaust our, our search uh, of the current candidates. And then if we can't find somebody out of that list, and that would be the most uh, expeditious process is to find a qualified uh, candidate who's we could select off the current uh, group of candidates that we have. Um, but if we can't find a candidate there, we'll, we'll post a new job posting. And we're not sure yet at what level. It could be an associate planner or an assistant planner, um, but trying to bring someone on full-time in preservation will be, uh, will be important because the city is extremely busy right now. Um, so we're, we're, that's a key priority for us um, to fill my position. Um, we do have two interns, as I mentioned. Both of these are public history students from Sacramento State, my and, and Bill's alma mater, among others. And um, those interns are Lena Filbert and Caitlin Greed. They have been doing a great job to sort of help get us through this transition. We brought them on uh, really, to, they're, they're the best, they're the, the, what we like to use them for, I should and that's the way I should put it. What we'd like to use them for is to work through our backlog of uh, nominations. So we have nominations we'd like to get to, and uh, these are landmarks and historic districts, and we'd like to have them assist with those. But with our uh, with our with the project work that I'm no longer able to to really focus on as the director, um, they have been stepping up and helping us process some of our staff level uh, review projects or design review function. Uh, with both landmarks and contributing resources in historic districts. So that's what they've been focused on now, but hopefully when we bring on a, another planner, they'll be able to take on that role a little more and we'll be, they'll, the interns will be able to focus on our, on the nominations that we have, uh, we're trying to prioritize. Um, and then also help with the grants because the grants will be uh, a key focus. Uh, but Director Anderson, is proposed to come back as a retired annuitant and his uh, paperwork has been submitted to the city council um, and is being reviewed and we're hoping to, to get approval uh, for his return and his primary uh, purpose would be to help manage these grants because especially the, um, the African-American Heritage Grant will be a key, uh, key, it'll be key to have someone in that role to really focus on that project because that will be um, quite a heavy lift uh, for whoever is ultimately tasked with managing it. So with that, um, I'm available to answer any questions. Um, I'm not sure if there are any in the chat that have been submitted, but, uh, but I'd be glad to answer any questions uh, that anyone has. Uh, I, I, the only thing I saw in the chat was a, a note for uh, someone to stop to turn off their mic because we can hear your breathing and that was probably me so sorry about that uh, just too they're too exciting i have kept gasping in amazement as the uh, comprehensiveness of the, your update um <laughs> if there are any questions you can raise your hands and you can actually i can uh, turn on your microphone or you can post a, a q a okay we do have a question i just uh vicky valine wants to say she's glad to see that you're in that position Thank you, Vicki. Um, looks like John has a, uh, a question about the objective standards. So the, uh, our objective standards, this, is, this project was really uh, managed by our urban design manager, Bruce Monaghan, uh, but the objective standards are a response to a to law passed by the state legislature known as uh, SB 35, or actually the Senate. Um, but the, the law says that um, cities can only apply objective standards to projects that meet certain requirements under a Housing Streamlining Act. So the city has been in the process of establishing some objective design review standards for historic districts. We've already drafted a set of standards for the, um, for the city as a whole, 
but now we're amending those standards to add historic districts to those to those design guidelines, um, or I should say, design standards and criteria because they are uh, they're required for these projects that meet these certain criteria um, for for housing um, for housing streamlining, and these the criteria um, went to the preservation commission in their final form for uh, a last review and comment by the commission. We did receive a number of comments regarding one of the, one of the standards which uh, restricted or, or um, required, uh, I guess I should say, which um, prohibited the copying of historic architectural styles within historic districts. And I would just add some context to this. Um, um, can you give me one minute? Thank you. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, so we may be interrupted from time to time. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the um, sorry, excuse me, I'm uh, losing my train of thought, but the, um, the um, so the, to add a little context to, the, to this uh, requirement or prohibition, um, Bruce Monaghan is an architect, the design review manager, who, um, who has a lot of experience, especially in, as a practicing architect, when um, the, the current trend for infill within historic areas and existing historic districts was to design um, Queen Anne buildings that really just tried to look like historic buildings and almost tried too hard. And so these, um, and you see them around and they'll make anyone cringe who sort of knows what they're looking at. Uh, and I think his intent was to keep that from happening. But as we uh, heard from the comments and discussed at the commission meeting, um, the, it, the, I think we all realized that this prohibition was really a solution in search of a problem uh, rather than addressing uh, a real issue that um, that the city is facing now, possibly an issue the city was facing 20 or 30 years ago, um, and so we'll be removing that from the um, we'll be removing that from the from where it appeared in those standards, and the final draft will not have that uh, prohibition within it. So we uh, we heard the comments and the commission uh, evaluated it and they looked at whether it should be rewritten or if it should be eliminated. And in the end, we just decided probably easier to just eliminate that standard. Um, it looks like John had a follow-up comment that uh, asking if there's still time for changes to occur. Yes, the, um, the we have not scheduled this draft to go to city council for approval. So until city council approves the draft, it, um, it is not final, final um, until they approve it. So uh, if you have comments, please send them to myself or Bruce Monaghan to, uh, to have a look at and we'll, we'll continue to refine the draft. We also caught some, some typos that were, in the, that were in the draft that we'll be uh, making changes to. So yes, please send us your comments. Thank you, Sean. I actually had a question related to that. There was a discussion, there's a brief mention at the meeting of bringing the document back to stakeholders. Is there a potential for Preservation Sacramento to be part of that stakeholder group? Or, uh, I Robert think we're, we will be um, sending the document prior to going to City Council. We'll, we will be sending uh, an email out, letting people know you know, we've because we've got to set a deadline at some point. Um, I mean, the more we actually are getting, not in historic districts, but we are getting an uptick in SB 35 projects. So the longer we wait to um, get this adopted, the higher the risk that we will get a project that comes in. And, if, and we have some objective standards uh, in the code and we have some objective standards in the citywide standards, and we have some objective standards um, in the historic district plans. But if we have an SB 35 project that comes in before this document gets adopted, we will um, we will not have the document to use to uh, to review the design, and it's really specific to designs in historic districts. So um, we do want to set a deadline at some point to to finalize the draft and get it to city council. But we uh, and we actually. 
had intended to circulate uh, the draft, um, send an email at least letting everybody know this is going to the Preservation Commission, but it, uh, it just didn't get put together in time. So yes, we'll be sending an email out to stakeholders and putting a final deadline for any additional comments uh, for us to look at before finalizing the draft. All right, thank you. And uh, thanks again for the update and congratulations again on your new position. So we'll hope to hear more at uh, the next round table in October. And uh, we will forward to our membership that announcement about the open positions on the Preservation Commission. Okay, thank you. I did send an update this morning on one, uh, one error in that first announcement. So if you just- Yes, I received that, that and we'll, we'll be doing that next week. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to see all your names. Um, and Hopefully next time it'll be uh, in person. All right. So John mentions the actions that were taken at the Preservation Commission this uh, past Wednesday. And I wanted to just provide a little feedback from the advocacy perspective on the positions that Preservation Sacramento took. We did send a letter of comment initially uh, joining in with Sacramento Modern and uh, the Art Deco Society in critiquing the evaluation that was done of this property, 2131 Q Street, the Beehive Building. And then we sent in a letter of support for the nomination. And part of that, part of how this came about was the Central City Specific Plan, which identified a number of lots throughout the Central City as opportunity sites. Basically, the idea is here's a place where people can build. However, one thing that happened in that process is many of these opportunity sites had historic resources on them, both listed like the Marshall School or that we'll talk about later and unlisted like this building and Sacramento Modern sent in a very comprehensive letter at the time back in 2018 saying hey there are historic resources here and if you don't identify them it's going to confuse developers and they're going to buy a lot and say oh it's an opportunity site so I can just clear it and then the, uh, discover that there's a potential <laughs> historic resource they still have to evaluate and that's exactly what happened here uh, what what uh, SACMOD and Preservation Sacramento said would happen and because the evaluations of the central city have never been complete. Uh, this building, which uh, was mentioned in the central city specific plan public comment, someone, uh, the, the site was purchased. I think it had been purchased about the same time. The shop off was the owner who came in and bought both the Sacramento B and the surrounding lots. And their statement as well, we assumed that we could just demolish it because it's on this opportunity site and we didn't realize that it was eligible. And so while it's always great, the, the purpose of survey is to identify historic places and to identify where the potential pinch points are before someone comes in with a plan. That didn't happen, even though we, we weren't, the, because we warned that it, it could. And so the developer for the site who wants to purchase this entire half block and build 41 row houses, which looks like a good project. It looks very similar to other ones that have been done in the central city where there's rows of narrowly spaced homes with uh, garages in the back and often there'll be a, an ADU on the ground floor. So it's, it's great infill and the project looks pretty good overall, but the problem is this historic resource. And the compromise that we came to was that if you do a project in the central city, as long as basically if there aren't historic resources or a couple of other very special circumstances on the site, you can build without doing an environmental impact report, which saves developers a lot of money and time. And it also encourages them to build around rather than on top of historic resources. And so what we're hoping to do now the developer has a plan, but they haven't submitted it yet, so there's still plenty of time to adjust it, is either to include, ideally to include this project, th this building in the project, so they can build townhomes and reuse this building. It could be reused as commercial, as community space, or as residential. There are a lot of different options, and there are plenty of great examples in Sacramento right now of projects just like this. There was a recent proposal, if some of you have been uh, keeping an eye on the Business Journal, for hundreds 
of new housing units to be built along North 16th Street in what's called the North 16th Street Historic District, which of course lost one of its contributors a couple of years ago, but there are still multiple other industrial brick buildings, the, the location of Rulin, Rulin's uh, office furniture and the across the street, the distribution site for, uh, pre previously it had been a distribution site for produce throughout the Sacramento Valley, and they're going to build the buildings inside these industrial spaces and reuse the industrial buildings. So we know it can be done and we know there, there are incentives like the Mills Act in order to make it easier to do. So the next challenge is working with the developer to hopefully find a compromise, something where they can make their money. We want them to make money. We want them to build housing and where we don't give up a historic resource without purpose. Richmond Grove. This is another effort that Preservation Sacramento has been making. It sounds like there there has been a a backlog of survey of, of property ba backlog of nominations of uh, historic districts and landmarks. Then, um, sadly, Sean, we're going to add some more. But we're working on the survey. Our consultant has been walking the neighborhood and documenting properties for the neighborhood of Richmond Grove, which is really one of the, the few corners of the central city that has never been surveyed. And uh, there was actually a comment made at the Preservation Commission that, oh, well, we can't survey every block in the city for potential historic resources. But the fact is that there are many cities, including this Los Angeles, not exactly a small city, that did projects that surveyed every lot. And Survey LA went all the way up to buildings built in 1980 to find out what which ones are potentially historic resources and flagging them. So areas that don't have a historic resource that are vacant, people know. They don't have to ask the question. They don't have to guess. They don't have to do an evaluation. They know in advance. Um, so we don't necessarily have all the resources to do that in Sacramento. But what can we do as advocacy organizations when we have the funds, and we did have some funds for this, that we're expending, we will survey areas that we think are particularly threatened. And the area of Richmond Grove that you can see here on this map, it's in between the Southside Park Historic District and the Poverty Ridge Historic District south of the R Street Historic District. And because Southside has this extension along T Street that you can see here, it's sort of a U-shaped district. And we're surveying the area south of S Street out to about 19th where the train tracks are and then north of W Street. So in between the area that was demolished by Highway 50 in what had traditionally been an extension of the Southside neighborhood. And it has a couple of unique features in that we discovered that part of the area that wasn't part of the Southside Historic District was along 10th Street, which many of you may feel familiar with. It's, uh, it's where Osaka-ya Manju Shop and their fabulous snow cones are located. And along 10th Street is the last remainder of a Japantown that was relocated from the old West End and built along 10th Street, partially demolished again by highway construction only a decade or so later. But there's a remnant of a Japanese American commercial district there. And similarly, along 16th Street or 15th Street, there are remnants of Chinese American businesses, principally along 16th. And so there are potential there for the several smaller districts with a commercial focus. And then in between are a residential neighborhood, which also has some commercial and industrial outliers. There's a big brick building at 13th and 14th and U Street, which was a metal shop. They manufactured automobile bodies. And this was an industrial use completely surrounded by a residential neighborhood. But a lot of people who lived in the neighborhood worked there. And so we think there's an association and to justify that building's inclusion as a contributor. And then the Koyasan Temple that you see indicated here is a, an old 1920s, originally it was an Italian apostolic church and then it became a Buddhist temple. And the, the actually when we did a tour of Rich and Grode in 2015, the, the Tycho drum group that practiced there performed at our home tour. But it's a site that has cultural and social significance to the community that was forced out of downtown Sacramento and moved into Southside and into Richmond Grove in the 1950s and 60s in the wake of redevelopment. And that's really one of the important contexts. The other place that you'll see on the far right 
WCIC, that's a Women's Civic Improvement Club, and this was an African-American women's organization formed in the late 30s, I believe, and they bought this house. It was previously the home of a German family with a lot of kids, so it had about 10 bedrooms, and it was used as not only as a community organization site, but also a boarding house for single African-American women who had very limited housing choices in the 1940s. 30s and 40s, and they later moved to another site on X Street, which was demolished by the freeway. And they still organize; they still exist as a civil, as a service organization in Oak Park. But this is one of those buildings, of the, all, similar to the Nathaniel Colley office on X Street, on S Street, which was listed as a Sacramento landmark earlier this year. In that, it has an African American context. The building itself, it's it's all right looking. It's kind of plain. It's a it's a Queen Anne with some modifications to it, but it has that social significance that we think is really important to call out. This is not just an area that's significant for its architecture, but we want to tell the story, the complete story of the people who lived here and the community that they represent. And then I now uh, I'd like to ask Karen Jacques to turn on her camera so she can give us an update about what is happening at the California State Capitol. And and uh, this is the photo that we I, I just use the photos that we that we were using of the fountain because I did want to call out the fountain and uh, our efforts to save it have been successful so we we do win one once in a while and but there's a, a larger battle coming up that Preservation Sacramento uh, joined in as an advocacy organization we contributed to a, a, a pending lawsuit but we we're not the primary partners in it but we wanted to help in the fight and we called on our members to support it. So Karen is a member of our board and she will fill us in on the state capitol and what's happening in the, on the annex. Yeah, thank you very much, Bill. And this is the perfect picture to start with because you you were we won the fight on the fountain and you can see the beautiful view um, toward the state capitol. And if the East Annex project goes forward as currently planned, that beautiful view among other aspects of the project will be completely lost. So we will have gained the fountain and, uh, and, and lost the wonderful view that it, it looks at. So um, I am a member, um, one of the founding members of PAC, which is Public Accountability for our capital. And we came together as we came to understand what the East Annex project really entailed. Um, it began with a need to do something about um, the Annex, which is an Eichler building built in 1952 as an addition to, cap uh, to the state capitol. And uh, it, it needs updating in terms of things like adequate wiring to deal with um, the computer world that we live in now and has a lot of deferred maintenance. So everybody agrees that something um, needed to be done with the annex. Um, but the joint rules committee decided um, without a review um, of the annex, and it and it's really isn't even the full joint rules committee. There's a, a little um, working group that involves uh, Ken Cooley, who chairs joint rules, um, a representative of Senate joint rules and a representative of the governor's office. And they decided without doing uh, a review of the annex and its potential for adaptive reuse that uh, it couldn't be fixed. Plus they decided it was too small, even though the legislature's getting a new um, known as a swing building uh, just to the to the south of the Capitol, but that it it couldn't possibly be fixed. It was too small and it had to be torn down. But they they didn't analyze that. They just decided that. And then uh, because of legislation in 1918, I'm sorry, 2018, um, they uh, they some other pieces were also um, added to the project. And one of them was. Uh, a new parking garage because they said, well, we can't have parking um, underneath um, a building in which the legislator, legislature meets because it could be a terrorist threat. So we need a new parking garage. So we'll put that in the park. First, they were going to put it uh, to the south of the capital of the park. Now it's moved 
um, to the east. And they decided, oh, and while we're at it, um, we can also update and enlarge the Vister Center. And we will do that um, by putting the center itself under the Capitol, but making its main entrance be that facade of the Capitol that you're looking at in the picture of the fountain. And so the Vista Center would from 10th um, down to the basement level of the Capitol would turn into a huge ramp. The, uh, the West Plaza of the Capitol would be gone and there would be, uh, it, we think it's not clear because so many things have been vague and questions have not been answered. We think of that first very wide tier of a couple of steps would probably be lost. And what you would get is this entrance to an underground Vista Center with a giant uh, Disneyland sign um, saying Vista Center in front of it, drastically changing um, the front facade. And then along with the loss of a historic building, the major modification of another um, and uh, a big new parking garage came major changes to Capitol Park. Um, the biggest of that being a, a huge loss of trees, um, loss to an expanded annex, which would go um, all the way to that, what's now um, an internal road between L and N, uh, where the city 12th Street once ran or, or would have run. Parking garage would be under that. Um, so you'd lose um, all the trees in the expanded um, footprint of the new annex all the way to the 12th Street. And the annex is also a bit wider in places, the new annex. Um, and then you would lose trees that would be where, have roots where the parking garage needs to go. And the parking garage would run um, from L to M with an entrance on one end and an exit on the other. And that also means taking out a large row of city trees on, on both of the parkway strips. Um, and then um, at the west end of the Capitol, again, with the, the Vister Center and the ramp, um, the landscaping um, at the front of the Capitol would be drastically changed. Um, and probably at least two of the deodars were part of the original planting would go. Um, the, this project has always been like a moving target. It keeps, it keeps changing. It seems to keep getting bigger and worse. Um, the latest thing is they're saying, well, uh, we could, um, maybe we could just move. We'll identify some trees that we could just move, but moving huge old trees um, doesn't necessarily mean that they will stay alive and how many trees we would lose and which ones and which ones they think they would move has also been a, a moving target that's been very hard to get a handle on because nothing that they say and nothing that's in uh, the original DEIR, the RDEIR, and they just, DGS has just um, certified a final EIR, and it's really hard to pin down a lot of this information. Um, so uh, as Bill said, there has now been um, a lawsuit. We had hoped that with lobbying and public pressure, we could get um, the rules, joint rules, to pause the project and, and reanalyze it and look at this stuff, but they, but they didn't. The EIR has moved forward. So um, there is a lawsuit. Um, it is our best chance, um, and we think there's a really good chance to get what we want to stop this and get a reevaluation that would get an annex that would meet um, the legislature's needs and preserve this incredible historic space. I mean, this is the capital of California. This is our suite of two uh, capital buildings on the National Register along with a beautiful beloved park also on the register and also a place that people deeply love and visit. So um, 
the, the lawsuit has been filed and we are now um, raising money to work on this, to, to help pay for the lawsuit. Our goal is $80,000. We've um, raised a bit over half of that and we're very grateful to everyone, including Preservation Sacramento that, uh, that donated. And probably all of you who are members of, of uh, Preservation Sacramento got an email asking you to donate. And I hope that many of you have. And I am here to ask again, you're at this meeting because you love and care about historic places. And this is a really key um, historic place and beloved space for all of us. And so I'm asking all of you to give whatever you can. No donation is too small. We are grateful for everything that we, we get and they add up. But if you haven't donated or you can donate something again, um, the link to make the donation is at um, PAC's website, which is um, savecalcap.org. So again, www.save calcap.org and it offers you an option of either donating online or um, an address uh, to which you can mail checks. And we really need to win this one. Sacramento would be a sad place if at you know one brief period in time, this beautiful complex buildings and park that, that have been passed down um, were suddenly radically and irreparably changed and they could not be brought back. So at, at that point, it would be too much gone. So thank you um, very much for, um, for listening and please donate because this matters to all of us. And one last comment, as, as a person who's also a, a climate advocate, we cannot afford to lose huge trees that absorb carbon and clean the air and help address the urban heat island effect. They are a wonderful environmental service as well as being part of a historic complex. So thank you. And if anyone has any questions, I'll do my best to answer about this, what I know current, most currently about this moving target. All right. I uh, saw that there were a couple of comments uh, about the, the qualifications of the legal counsel doing the suit and the basis for the lawsuit. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the legal counsel in this case, that's um, maybe you could fill us in on who the attorney is. It's, it's Susan Brown Holly is the attorney. Um, the case has been filed. As I think most of you know, um, she is very, very well known for her work on CEQA historic preservation issues. Um, it is a CEQA lawsuit. Um, it, uh, it began as um, a pre, what's known as a pre-commitment lawsuit, which is when uh, a, a decision gets made about a historic resource without doing any evaluation to determine whether that historic resource could be um, rehabbed and adaptively reused. And now that the, uh, that the uh, EIR, the final EIR has been certified, um, there, um, there will probably be, and I, I'm not an attorney, but um, that has just happened. And Susan is looking uh, at how to respond, how best to respond to the additional information that we now have. Um, we filed the pre-commitment suit first because what we wanted to avoid was a situation of one day the EIR is certified and the next day um, we have a wrecking ball and that can't happen with the suit filed. So um, that's uh, that's what the suit um, is. And Okay. 
So it sounds like because the suit has been filed, the, there isn't going to be an immediate threat of exca excavation and tree removal just because the EIR has been certified? That's, yes. They, they can't just, I mean, I can't speak to the legal technicalities of it, but since the suit has been filed, um, they, they cannot do that. Um, since we now have new information about what, uh, you know, what's in the final EIR and what continues to be missing of issues that have been raised, you know, Susan is um, analyzing that right now to decide um, how best to respond to that additional uh, information. Okay, well, thank you very much, Karen. Thanks for the update. And uh, we'll try to keep to do what we can to keep our members informed, keep the community informed. As far as what we can do to spread the word, social media is a powerful tool. And we'll, so we try to use that as well as our email list. And then beyond that, uh, who can say it's mostly a matter of getting getting in, in, into the touch of, of traditional media, which uh, is understaffed and underpaid and and, and overwhelmed by and overwhelmed. everything that is, I mean, this is the worst possible time to get major traction with this issue when COVID's exploding and fires are exploding and mm -hmm. Afghans exploding, but, uh, and we're, PAC is really, really grateful to Preservation Sacramento for everything that you have done and continue to do. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. And we'll move on to uh, the next uh, item on our and that, uh, Karen, I'll have you turn your camera off. And then, Alexa, if you could turn your camera on. Yes. And, uh, Hello. So just to tell us about yeah. your new organization in Roseville. And I'll just let you take it away. If you'd like to share screen or have slides, feel free to do so. Oh, gosh. I totally don't have anything like that. But uh, my name is Alexa Roberts. I am the founder and president of a nonprofit called the Belvedere Preservation Alliance, which is uh, focused on advocating for the preservation, restoration, and adaptive reuse of Roseville's historic buildings and landmarks. And yes, we do have historic buildings in Roseville. Um, the nonprofit is named after the Belvedere Hotel, which was a 1917 gorgeous craftsman hotel in our little historic district. Um, for two years, I led an effort to protect that building from a plan to demolish it, to build 18 four-story condo units in our historic district. And what we experienced as a community over those two years, trying to stop the demolition, really showed us that short of having preservation ordinances in place, nothing is going to stop the city planning commission or the city council from approving any plan that demolishes any building in Roseville. Um, I filed an appeal. We had news coverage, thousands, almost 7,000 signatures on a petition, um, statements from the historical society and preservation lawyers and neighborhood associations, all of that. Um, in the end, it was ultimately demolished about a year ago. And the Roseville Planning Commission and the City Council made it clear to us that they will always side with the developers and will not even attempt to figure out a compromise uh, the hotel had a bunch of land around it, and we were asking that they create a plan that would require that they build around it. So maybe they would have 14 condo units rather than 18. It wasn't even up for discussion. So I get excited hearing about compromises like that in Sacramento. Um, I am born and raised in Roseville. I don't have any background in any of this. So I'm, I'm very new. I've learned a lot in the last couple of years. Um, before I heard about what was going to happen to the hotel, I assumed, not knowing any better, that Roseville's historical buildings were protected in some way. I called the Office of Historic Preservation, and when I explained what was happening and where it was happening, I found out pretty quickly that Roseville's sort of notorious for having literally nothing when it comes to historical preservation. Um, so back in the late 70s, we did at least establish our Old Town Roseville Historic District, and we had ordinances that went along with that. But what happened was in 2009, um, when we passed our downtown specific plan, it nullified all of those ordinances. And even people who were involved in establishing all of that had no idea that everything they had built was wiped away. Even the Historical Society had no idea. Um, the Planning Commission will sort of 
deter people who ask about historic preservation in Roseville by saying that we have a significant buildings list, which is pretty impossible to find. I had them email it to me, short list of very random buildings that people paid a lot of money to put their building on this list. The purpose of the list is to avoid the demolition of these buildings unless someone wants to build something new. So you can see that's um, nothing. Um, they do offer the opportunity for public comment before it's demolished. So yeah, we have a, a lot of work to do in Roseville. Um, after we lost the hotel, I formed the nonprofit. Um, our board's made up of people who sort of came together through the process of the appeal and everything that we had done for the hotel. Um, and we've been able to refocus on the broader picture of what needs to happen in Roseville. So we wanna make sure that Roseville adopts a historic preservation program, which will offer legitimate recognition and preservation for our historic properties. Um, so we have a petition going for that, um, including a citywide review of historical properties and things that we've just never had here. So I'm hoping to have at least a thousand signatures before I send it to the city council. It's been a little slow getting signatures because this time around, I can't really afford to pay for all the Facebook ads and all of that. Um, so probably 99% of the names we have on this petition are for me, my just me going door to door. Um, and so we have 670 something signatures right now, and it's been really hot lately. So nothing lately, <laughs> it was too hot for me to go door to door. Um, but uh, any help spreading the online petition is super helpful. I'm fairly new to all of this. So any advice when it comes to how to go about presenting it the right way to the city or anyone who wants to offer expertise in any way would be really helpful. Um, I'm up against some big scary people, so I'll take all the help I can get. <laughs> um, I have been spending a lot of time between petitioning door to door just educating the public about what's going on um, and telling people about the history of different buildings in Roseville through our Instagram and our Facebook page. Um, I'm seeing so much interest from locals. I really haven't talked to any locals or building owners so far that haven't been really excited and supportive and want this. Um, uh, I'm just really thankful I'm thankful that we have such a great example of a city that successfully adopted a program like this in Sacramento. Um, I know it's always an ongoing fight, obviously, as we're hearing today, but you guys are light years ahead of us. So I, I dream of having what you guys have in Roseville. I'm just, I'm honored to be here. So that's, that's my spiel. Um, not raising money or anything like that right now. I'm excited to um, send a donation for the capital. Um, fight. But uh, our website is savehistoricroseville.org, which has the petition. It has links to our Facebook page and our Instagram, which is Belvedere Preservation Alliance. But savehistoricroseville.org is the website. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, I can try to answer them. <laughs> okay. I don't see any questions for you, but Thank, thank you for introducing yourself and for that presentation and I, I, the naming the organization after the loss of the Belvedere Hotel. It can be the, 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 a symbol, even one that's lost can mm -hmm. be pretty powerful. People in New York City still talk about Penn Station and in Sacramento, the rallying cry of remember the Alhambra, the laws of the Alhambra Theater half a century ago still resonates with people. And so that kind of image of a, a lost landmark can really help connect people. And I, I, um, I grew up in uh, Citrus Heights and spent a lot of time in Roseville biking out to the, the wonderful mid-century library there near the zoo and the, yeah. the neighborhoods of old Roseville, Craftsman bungalows, Queen Anne's revival cottages, and of course the commercial Art Deco and other historic styles along Vernon Avenue. 
We're and not known for it, but we've got it. <laughs> it's 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 most certainly there, and that yeah. that railroad history and the commercial uh, the commercial history. Uh, the the thing about history is that it's really hard to take people on a walking tour of uh, like a, a Walmart and say, "Hey, here's what used to be on the where the parking lot is today." It's it's kind of a a, a sad thing. And that's definitely a little ironic that their their list of historic resources is says, well, here's a, a a list of buildings that you can't knock down unless you want to. New, because why <laughs> would you knock a building down? But okay, yeah. yeah. And so. I I responded to their email saying like, do you understand how that doesn't really equate to anything? And never any response, you know, because how do you explain that? Yeah, okay. I, I do see a hand up from Jennifer Stanley. So uh, Jennifer, I'm going to turn on your microphone and let you ask your question. Go right ahead. Mute. Okay, I, I, it took me a minute there to un, <laughs> unmute. Um, two questions, actually. Um, are you getting any media coverage? And do you are you seeking any? I'll take Anything I can get, absolutely. I haven't yet. I actually got a text yesterday from someone with the Roseville Press Tribune asking if I wanted to do an article. Um, but since we formed the nonprofit, I, I haven't seeked out the news just yet. But I'm, if you have any ideas, absolutely. Well, no, I'm sorry. I don't know Roseville. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my second question was, can your organization support the the historic ch issues we have at the Capitol just by voting to support what's happening, you know. Well, the way- the They're planning to do. Yeah, the mission of the nonprofit officially is for Roseville history, but I have no problem posting about anything going on anywhere. So I plan on posting on our, our Facebook page about, uh, about what's happening at the Capitol. And I've posted I posted about uh, the fountain and things like that before, and I'm so excited that that's worked out. Um, yeah, I love the Capitol, and I'll definitely, I've been posting about um, the Marshall School too, because we should all be helping each other out. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alexa. Good luck. Thank you, I need it. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a powerful thing is is uh, having those kind of regional connections and people who are doing similar things and uh, both getting inspired by people who have been doing it and yeah. getting inspired by people who are just starting out. Yeah. So I, you guys, I, I think it would seem way more overwhelming if I didn't have you guys as an example right next door, you know, because um, we're smaller than you. Like, it's not that big a feat. Come on. Mm -hmm. And then we have one of the questions. Do you have to be a Roseville resident to sign the petition? No, you do not. I do ultimately want a certain amount of Roseville signatures, but I will take signatures from anywhere. All right. And then uh, there was one comment about, you, you, so you're a 501c3 rather than a c4? Correct. All right. Then the, the, the dis differences between them are, are kind of minor. Uh -huh. uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, maybe mythology about what C C3s can or can't do, and C3s most definitely can take positions that about uh, the, but their educational positions. Mm -hmm. C3s aren't allowed to support candidates or support or oppose uh, ballot initiatives. C4s can support or oppose ballot initiatives, but not candidates. And then C3s can do a very limited amount of lobbying. C4s mm -hmm. can spend all their money on lobbying if we want to. Yeah. We've got other things to do. But uh, mm -hmm. C3 does have other advantages and that contributions are tax deductible. So that's a, it's a good, powerful tool as, as far as getting people involved. And uh, people want to know, can, if, or can they write it off in their taxes or get a receipt for contributions? Mm -hmm. And so that's, a, that's an excellent thing. So so thank you for filling us in and letting us know what's happening in Roseville. And our next speaker on the agenda is Doug Bojack, who is, uh, I'll have him turn his camera on now. And, uh, Alexa, I'll have you switch off. And Doug, I'll just have you dive right in. You can uh, share your, if you have a presentation or slides, you can share your screen at any time. Great, thank you. All right, well, uh... Get going then. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit about preservation and, and restoration uh, in a slightly different context than than housing or, or buildings. I'm going to be talking about ecological 
preservation and restoration and cemeteries um, and the overlap that can uh, that can result, uh, particularly at the St. Joseph Catholic Cemetery, which, uh, as you mentioned, is just south of Broadway uh, in the Curtis Park neighborhood along um, 21st Street. To just go over a few slides, I'll talk a little bit about the, the current status of the cemetery, the opportunity that uh, its status presents, the proposed methodology of how we can advance um, preserving and restoring some of the habitat there, some examples of other locations that have done similar work, other folks in the community uh, that can provide expert support and, and what they offer, uh, a proposed timeline of what this project could look like, and uh, how Preservation Sacramento and those of uh, us who are engaged in, in preservation work can support and really take part and support this um, and hopefully have time to answer some questions. So the, uh, the cemetery was built out at the, a little after the turn of the last century. Uh, it's a historic resource. Um, you know, I would contend there's beautiful uh, grounds, there's different types of above ground mausoleums, there's in ground um, uh, burials, there's plaques, um, but surrounding the, the burial sites uh, is really not very much. There's, there are, I you know, do wanna acknowledge there are a number of um, majestic oak trees that, that exist on the site, but there's a lot of dormant or dead um, turf grass and Bermuda grass. And it's, it's really not a, a, a particularly attractive cemetery to walk through, um, although it's quite large. And that really gives us an opportunity to do um, some significant um, ecological restoration to enhance the cemetery visit visiting experience um, while providing a lot of these benefits uh, for climate change, for habitat and biodiversity. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is, you know, just a, an image of what the Sacramento area looked like a few, just a few hundred years ago. Um, we had oak savannas and oak woodlands. Uh, and this is something that the cemetery be, is well positioned to, to really bring back um, in the heart of the city through uh, this proposed methodology of really having a memorial tree, perennial and wildflower program. And those of you, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty, I think, well-known um, methodology of donors making tax deductible gifts to the, the diocese, the Catholic diocese, which oversees the cemetery uh, and that supports project implementation and maintenance of trees and landscaping. Uh, using native oaks and native plants is, uh, works well with this sort of uh, type of project. Oaks have that, you know, symbolic, uh, have that symbolism of strength and, and longevity. And then using uh, understory plants of, of perennial flowering shrubs and wildflowers um, offers an opportunity to engage folks with different levels of giving, different levels of, of recognition and, and memorial memorialization, um, but also uh, enhancing the habitat value of the trees, so you don't just have an overstory of trees, you have a complete plant community that supports, um, you know, the, the, a full range of, of habitat use. And in this case, the, the St. Joseph Cemetery is not really um, used for, for new burials. It's, um, when you could say full, that it's, it's really just, uh, is not really used or, or taken advantage of in really any capacity. Very few folks uh, walk through it, visit it, um, and so it's a, <laughs> excuse, please excuse the pun, it's a dead space uh, in the city. And this allows the reuse of that sort of um, historic resource there by um, activating it and, and bringing people out to, to, to walk through the graves and enjoy the, the space. To go through a couple of inspirational examples, um, the Davis Cemetery actually runs uh, a memorial tree program through its memorial tree and, and garden program it does a very similar has a very similar scope of work where they've restored um, an extensive amount of their cemetery using native plants and flowers uh, and have partnered with Tree Davis, the, their local tree advocacy group. Um, and Tree Atlanta has also done um, quite a bit of this work, doing thousands, you know, planting thousands of trees across a number of cemeteries engaging with their cemeteries to um, become certified wildlife habitats. And in Sacramento, we have an opportunity to do that as well. The Sacramento Tree Foundation uh, 
very well known, you know, has partnered with Preservation Sacramento on the, the capital annex uh, issue. And here is an opportunity for them to provide their species, their tree species selection uh, expertise, uh, help with landscape design uh, for a project this size, uh, as long as irrigation is in place, which there is a, an irrigation system that's, that exists uh, at the cemetery, although it's not currently operating. But with, with that revitalized, um, there's an opportunity to provide hundreds of trees to fill the space. Um, the Native Plant Society also has similar expertise in, in matching plants with trees. Um, there's the local uh, soil borne farms uh, nursery that uh, is run through the, the local chapter of Native Plant Society, um, providing access to those low cost plants. Uh, and obviously volunteers would be much appreciated, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, um, not just engaging on planting days and, um, and around the actual physical work, but publicizing this sort of program for those who would um, be interested in memorializing um, friends, family uh, through this program. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about the, the proposed timeline. So still in the very earliest stages, um, still gathering support from from organizations like Preservation Sacramento, like uh, the local ecology nonprofits, um, so that we can present a, a unified voice and a unified front and a, a legitimate project proposal to the, the diocese, which I hope to do later uh, this year in the winter of, of 2021. Um, going forward from that, if the diocese is receptive, uh, you know, receptive to this sort of project, we can. I'll work with I'll work with them on defining and establishing roles and responsibilities, uh, and then start that process of figuring out just where trees and, and plants can go and how that can be integrated into the landscape. And from there, uh, it's it's a publicity blitz, hopefully uh, through the summer and fall of next year. Uh, wall volunteers come out in a couple of days to work on. Um, working on the turf conversion, to, so um, figuring out the process to probably remove or, or kill off the, the existing Bermuda grass uh, and start prepping the site for planting trees and native plants. Um, and then with the, the, the hope being that about a little over a year from now that the, the fun part of, of reaching the, the planting days to begin planting memorial trees uh, around that cemetery and then um, engaging with volunteers to, to continue to stop by to monitor the trees, to monitor the plants um, so that we can work on replacing those that have died or been vandalized um, until we have a, a more mature landscape um, that continues on. And so this is, this is why, I'm, why I'm talking with you today. Uh, Preservation Sacramento as you know, a, a, an organization and with folks who are engaged um, in long-term thinking and, and care for their local environment. I hope that extends uh, a little, you know, to, to cemeteries, to, you know, the historical nature of them and what you can find in them. And I'd really like to um, open this up to inv involving Preservation Sacramento as just a, as another partner to help legitimize this proposal um, when, when I speak with the diocese about it and publicizing the project to those of you um, who would like to, you know, purchase memorial trees um, or and or volunteer um, in the future through the uh, through the, the the planting days and the irrigation days or or whatever it ends up being, um, and I'll open it up for some questions. Thank you. All right, it looks like Jennifer Stanley has her hand up and also entered a question. So I'll let her go ahead and ask the question live. Right, oh, this is amazing. And whatever possessed you to take this on? I, I think it's just fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, I go up 21st pretty often and uh, go by the cemetery and see, you know, just a lot of open space and it's, it's um, crying out, I think, for, for some revitalization. Oh, absolutely. It is. Thank you so much. And I have one kind of question. On the first slide, there's a beautiful bird sitting on the column. Was that 
photo taken in Sacramento? Because I've only seen that bird in Africa. Uh, no, it wasn't. I did, I did steal that off of um, the Tree Atlanta <laughs> website. Um, but it's similar looking birds. So th that would be, you know, probably in, in our community, a scrub jay, you know, the, the ones that you see all, all over. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say, where, wait a minute, I want to see that bird. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. And then we had a question from Peter Gannett. Um, the memorializing programs for existing residents of the cemetery, or is, is it intended for existing cemetery and interred, or can it be for memorials for people who, uh, who aren't? buried in the cemetery? So these, the, there's a number of questions um, that I'll need to work through with the diocese. I haven't spoken with the diocese about this um, because I, I don't want to bring them uh, a half-baked plan yet. I, I'd like to have as many local organizations um, that have indicated support so that I can really um, show them there's a, a broad swath of, of the city and, and folks who, are, um, who would like to see this done and, and, and offer help in different ways. Um, so I think some of these questions like who, who, you know, who's possible, you know, would you have to be, you know, a practicing Catholic to be memorialized? I don't know if that's a, a requirement of Catholic cemeteries. Um, you know, and I, I see in the chat here about where, you know, proposed trees like specifically would be planted. Um, I think that's another type of question for the cemetery, you know, for the cemetery operators to weigh in on and, um, would want to be flexible at this point about what works for them. Okay. So, all right, so for, come from our perspective, just so you know, um, as I'm sure you're aware, there's another cemetery further down Broadway. Right. And Preservation Sacramento has commented um, in support of that cemetery. There, there, there's a 501c3, the nonprofit that was leading tours and planting roses. And there was some conflict, as you're, I'm pretty sure you're aware, about management of the cemetery and its continuing stewardship. And so you might get some good advice by talking to the Old City Cemetery Committee and talking to the city of Sacramento about their efforts and their plan regarding the, the Old City Cemetery and, and potentially some inspiration or some guidance as, uh, for your own plans. And then just in my own experience with the old city cemetery, they, their tours, uh, there, there have been tours of the old city cemetery discussing some of the significant people who were buried there as, and I think there have been similar tours at East Lawn in East, in, or in, in East Sacramento. And so that might be potentially a, a, a uh, both an attention generator and a revenue generator for this sort of effort. And then just to the general topic of landscape preservation is that historic landscapes, whether natural landscapes that have cultural significance or designed landscapes like a cemetery or a park are very, very much part of the historic preservation picture. And so the while very often the focus and the attention tends to be on historic buildings and houses, the idea of landscape, of trees, and how it all comes together in a historic district. Places like Boulevard Park, for example, where the landscape design was very much part of the overall design of the property, while on the other side of the city, as you mentioned in the beginning of the last century, this cemetery was being designed and placed and it was intended as a place of quiet repose and of peace and shelter and then things like tree canopy and shade are very much part of that in the city with sacramento's climate and uh our state with our climate that needs all the all the trees and and cooling and comfort that it can get certainly all right. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions that have come up while I was rambling. And then, uh, Doug, there's a question. Do you have, are we willing to provide your contact information or what, whatever way that people can get in touch with you? You can type it into the chat if that would be easiest. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll just leave my email out here. It's my personal email. I'm just doing this through a personal capacity. So feel free to uh, send me any emails or thoughts you have about this. All right. Oops, I can send this. Oh, yeah to everyone. All right. Well, thank you, Doug, for your presentation and for sharing this information with us. It's certainly, I'm sure it's going to spur some further discussion. And it's great to see uh, someone, the, the, just the, the example of someone walking by a place and rather than saying somebody ought to do something, saying 
I ought to do something and taking it on. And so hopefully we'll get lots of other hands to help you. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Okay. And then uh, next, our, um, looks like our, our tour chair, Louis Sumter, was not able to attend the meeting. I think he may be having some, some other scheduling conflicts. So I'll go ahead and just give a very brief update on our home tour and we'll send out an email about this in the coming in th this coming week which isn't happening in person didn't happen last year for obvious reasons and this year we decided fairly early on that we would do a virtual home tour so it will be online and we're trying to look at ways to you know, how can we make a virtual home tour special to capture some of the great things that about the the in-person tour there are a couple advantages to having a virtual tour. For starters, number one is safety in our current situation and that people who are concerned about risk going into a strange person's house or having 500 people come through your house are mitigated by having a virtual tour. Second is accessibility. For people who can't climb stairs, this is going to be an opportunity where they can, they, they can come on the tour where they previously couldn't before or were very limited as far as what sites on the tour that they could visit, places where there was a capacity for accessibility in the tour buildings. And also for people who are far away, for people who used to live in Sacramento and didn't necessarily want to fly back for the historic home tour, this is an opportunity for former Sacramentans to check out what's happening preservation-wise in Sacramento. The date is Sunday, October 24th. We had to push back the original date, which would have been in September, but we felt like with because it's online, we're also weather independent. We don't have to worry about getting rained out. And so we could push it back farther into the fall, which gives us more time. We have hired professional video crews, and the rest of it is a very steep learning curve, as I'm discovering, is that putting together a video like this is much more complex than what I'm used to, is more putting together a PowerPoint and, and then rambling for an hour. It's a lot more structured, but it's also, it's been a great uh, learning opportunity because this is something that we will be able to do and take with us into the future. And uh, as with, with everybody else, learning how to do online events, learning how to do videos means that these are things that we can do now. But of course, we are going to be going back to, to non-virtual when we can. And so we'd hope to have more update for you about this subject. But obviously, we, we're limited to, to what we can do. And the home tour will be on October 24th. We will have ticketing information and more information about the houses. Some of you may recognize the building in the background of this this photo, the, the BN Bugby house. It's one of the houses we're currently working with the owner about getting it on the tour. And there are some other pretty amazing places. And uh, oh, actually one other final advantage is that because we're not a physical tour, we can go citywide. And so there will be places all over the city, not just in one neighborhood, not just in a, a, the central city, but throughout the city of Sacramento. We did have, a, looks like we have a question from John Marshak that the, will the home tour be recorded for viewing at a later date? We did have some discussion about that. It looks like we will not be hosting it for later reference but what we're going to do is we're offering both on the day of the event we're going to have two showings we'll have a, an early showing and a late showing for people who can't necessarily make the same time and we're also looking at having a replay two weeks later so ticket holders who can't make the uh, october 24th date i think we're looking at doing it two weeks later the the first weekend of november but we will also have confirmation and details about that in the next week or two at most. So again, I apologize for our delays on this. We're trying to do what we can and leap over this steep learning curve and uh, to present what we can. It'll be a, a educational and entertaining and beneficial experience. This uh, The home tour is traditionally our main fundraiser. It's how we are able to afford to do things like do historic building surveys when the city doesn't have the funds to do so uh, or to do outreach to contribute uh, to lawsuits or other efforts to save historic properties and so this is how the work gets done as long uh, along with your membership and speaking of which uh, as usual the if you are a member of preservation sacramento you will be able to get a discount on your ticket 
And so our final item that we posted about online about a week ago in both social media and via email was that we were contacted by representatives of the Marshall School New Era Park Neighborhood Association asking if we would post on our most endangered buildings page uh, that have the Marshall School on there because it's pretty endangered. And we decided that once we looked at the page, that it's really out of date. And we wanted to, we decided we could brainstorm about what places in Sacramento were most endangered, or we could just ask our members and ask our community. And so these uh, slides that you're about to see are the places that were suggested. And I put them in alphabetical order and we'll just go through them. There's eight. And then we will, uh, there is an opportunity for some questions. So if we will have quick Q&A, I saw that George Rea put his hand up and I'll give him an opportunity to speak as well as answering other questions. But I wanted to go through the properties first. First one, obviously the California State Capitol. You heard Karen's update about the um, project for the annex and for the visitor center that would obstruct the front of the building. And, uh, but we know that we, we did manage to save the fountain, but can we save the Capitol? That's an open question. Del Paso Boulevard. In uh, 2019, we did a historic home tour on Del Paso or in, in, in the neighborhood just north of Del Paso. And in 2018, we did two walking tours on Del Paso Boulevard. And, and that boulevard is like several other commercial corridors in Sacramento, like Stockton Boulevard, like Broadway. Is It used to be a, a highway, it used to be a major commercial corridor, and it's fallen on hard times. There are historic resources. There are neighborhoods and legacies in these neighborhoods, and many of them have fallen into disrepair, but there's a lot of interest and a lot of economic interest in these, these places. And the question is, how can we engage with stakeholders, with the community, the people who live in the neighborhoods alongside these buildings, as well as with business community, with representatives of the city and other organizations to utilize historic resources like this historic Art Deco Theater on Del Paso Boulevard, or like the, the school at 670 Dixie Ann, which we recently, uh, with funding from Capital City Preservation Trust, got listed in the National Register with the intent of facilitating reuse and using historic preservation as an economic development tool rather than than the traditional mode of, of demolish and rebuild, but of infill, of urban repair in a way that involves the neighborhoods, involves the communities, the people who already live there, who have lived there, and being able to express the old and the new side by side. We got a comment from a resident of Marshall School neighborhood, or, or new, I think Newark Park neighborhood, about alleys. And specifically, the, uh, there are still some alleys in the central city and elsewhere in the city that are unpaved. And that there's a lot of focus and interest on alleys these days for infill development, for new construction and housing. But part of what the appeal of these alleys has traditionally been is that the fact that they kind of look like a country lane. And what are we losing? We talked a little bit about landscape architecture. We talked about the cemetery. What landscapes are we losing in our alleys? Another feature of alleys that maybe is underrated is an unpaved alley. Yeah, sure, they're muddy and dusty, but it also, it's permeable. Water can seep through into the ground from the, the surface via rainfall. And there were some experiments, if you're familiar with Leestall Alley between L and Capitol and 18th, where Old Soul is located, they used permeable pavers on that alley. But a lot of alleys have been paved since then, but with the traditional concrete and a, a drain, a storm drain. So rather than a permeable surface where the water can recharge back into the water table, it goes straight into the sewers. And uh, with water being another critical California issue, uh, let's let's look at those alleys. And yes, there's a lot of room for housing. And yes, there's a lot of room for development on the alleys. But what else? Well, what do we lose when we make room for those? And can we make room for both? The Fainted Ladies, uh, based on the Fainted Ladies tours from the 90s and 2000s, are three homes on 21st Street built in the early 19-teens between Powerhouse Alley and Q Street. 
And the owner of these three buildings proposed demolishing them about five years ago. Preservation Sacramento submitted a revised evaluation of the three homes in order to add them to the Wind Park Historic District, which was approved. And the hope was that these buildings would be rehabbed and turned into housing rather than being demolished to turn into a new apartment building. And the owner, to their credit, submitted a plan and paid an architect to develop a plan to convert all three of these buildings, to keep the buildings, but to convert them into fourplexes. And all three of these buildings, they were they were single family homes, but they, well, the one on the, the far left is a, a duplex, but they were all basically a communal housing where about half a dozen people were living in each house just sharing them. But if they were converted to fourplexes, they effectively already were multiplex housing. And it was a good plan, but unfortunately it still hasn't moved forward. And in the four years since this photo was taken, the buildings have gotten into worse and worse shape. And so that was the, the concern why it was added to the list is that just being listed as a historic resource isn't the end of the story. It still needs a project and still needs a way to save them. And there are even some, some offline discussions with the developer who's proposing the town houses across the site is about this is a potential mitigation measure, but we'll learn more later. And then, of course, there's the Marshall School itself, which is, I believe it was built in 1903. It is, again, it's a listed landmark. It's also listed as an opportunity site on that list of opportunity sites that we talked about earlier in the meeting. And there was a proposal uh, by David Mogavero and Bardis Homes of to build new housing in two new wings alongside this building on the parking area, the, the, the former playground area, and on top of the, the accessory building located on the western side, and converting the central building also to housing. So what had been classrooms would become lofts. And then you would also gain full accessibility to the building, which currently it's, it's not really accessible by adding elevators in the new buildings that would connect to the the wings where you see the staircases are on the side and then the sacramento b building across uh from the other the, the other buildings we've talked about this meeting the the, um, the the beehive and the fainted ladies this is a mid-century landmark and really the only building in Sacramento was directly associated with the newspaper industry. It has had several alterations, including large expansion to the east and some changes to the secondary facades and also to the, the primary entrance. There's a new lobby area that wasn't there originally. And so there's some questions about whether or not it has full integrity, but a historic building doesn't have to have full integrity. It has to have enough to convey its significance. And the B building, that's that's an open question. And what are the potential for, for adaptive reuse, for conversion of the existing printing plant area, which is a much newer building. It's not eligible. It's only about 20, 30 years old. But the building on the corner, the, a very prominent corner of the tallest hill in the central city, which has a wonderful new infill building right across the street on, on what used to be a parking lot. But how do we connect people to that that part of Sacramento's history. And that's a, that's a good question. So the B building definitely qualifies. We also got a comment about the land, South Land Park neighborhood. And the person who submitted this had a couple of different things to say about the neighborhood as a whole, is that it's principally a single family home neighborhood and a neighborhood that's generally without sidewalks and has limited transit access. And they are concerned about uh, upzoning and changes changes to the way that zoning is done throughout the city and whether or not allowing multifamily would result in demolition of the, the homes of Southland Park or whether it would have all changes in, in terms of traffic and things like that. Uh, one piece of news about an element of South, uh, actually Southland Park Hills, and I believe this might be, is that there is the first historic district in, in this area uh, of our Eichler tract. The one Eichler tract in Sacramento is slowly moving forward for listing in the Sacramento Register. And hopefully, we've, I'm hoping that that will engage people in the community to look at creation of historic districts and advocacy for creation of those districts as a tool to protect what's important about our neighborhoods, to protect the architecture, to protect that legacy. And without having to give up flexibility and without 
losing the ability to make room for more homes. And in many of our neighborhoods where there's a vacant lot, where there's a parking lot, where there's other places, it's, it's a little easier versus a fill, fully built out neighborhood where you have to demolish something to gain something. But the one thing about housing is it's additive. If you demolish existing housing to build new housing, you don't get as much housing. And because you demolished the older buildings, which traditionally might be less appealing to renters, you're losing housing on the more affordable end of the spectrum. But if we can add without subtracting, you gain more. Another mid-century resource that was recommended was the entrances to the Sacramento Zoo, the hyperbolic paraboloids, which currently are there in approaching structural failure. This is an old photo, but if you've been there recently, you'll know that they're supported by steel posts in order to stop them from collapsing. Now, this is a, it's a dramatic piece of architecture. It's an iconic piece of architecture that's associated with our, with our zoo and with William Land Park. And so that's that, why this particular bit of mid-century was called out. And those are the buildings, the places, so, okay, George, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn on your mic so you can speak. And if you would unmute, you can uh, share your thoughts with us. Okay. Hi, I'm George Raya. Um, I live in the Marshall School New Era Park neighborhood, and I'm on the board of directors. Been on the board for like 15 years now. Um, I was on the committee that the school board, the Sacramento Unified School District Board, appointed to review proposals as to what to do with Old Marshall School. I think it was last year's, maybe five, seven years ago. I, I can't remember the date, but uh, it was declared unusable because of structure, you know, uh, earthquake regulations and stuff. So it's been sitting empty. And those of us that live across the street from it have watched it totally deteriorating. There used to be at one point a hole in the roof that allowed water to leak all the way to the first floor. We took a, a tour of the building and really, I, I mean, my God, talk about demolition by neglect. The school board is responsible for that property and they're just letting it deteriorate. So we've been really after them. And, and they've been somewhat cooperating, but the committee that I sat on that reviewed proposals, there were three proposals submitted. We selected the one from Borgavera, which was to adapt the property to senior housing. Five years ago, five years ago, it was approved by the select committee and then sent to the school board there has been no action for five years. They've sat on it. They've done this. They've researched that. Um, you know, they would go, well, do we do a property exchange? Do we do this? Do we do that? You know, do we sell the property outright? <sighs> Talk about slow as molasses in winter. We need help to get that school board moving off its butt. I mean, yes, there've been other issues coming to them, but for five years, hey, we didn't have COVID-19 five years ago. You know, we didn't have a lot of issues five years ago and they have sat on it. I mean, there's been changes on the board. I mean, Ellen, when she was our representative was very helpful when we went to her to help reopen Washington Elementary School. I mean, we've had experience with the school board and it's very, very slow in working with them, but we've never had this kind of experience where it's taken five years for a project. And I have to really thank the uh, architect, Morvera, for hanging on. How many of us would have hanged on to a project after five years? We would have walked away. I would have given up. They have stuck with it because David Morgavera himself is at that point in his life where he wants to downsize and move into the central city. He's a senior. He's looking at living there on that property himself. 
And it's only two blocks from the Hart Senior Center. It's the ideal location to put senior housing. Help us, please, get the school board to move, to act. Uh, there is a fire right in front of the school, a car. You know, we'll post photographs. We have posted photographs because we have a Facebook page called uh, Help uh, Save Old Marshall School. And we have a photograph, a, a burnt out shell. You think that you're some bombed out building or something because there's this shell of an automobile right in front of the building so lucky that none of the trees in the in the property got on fire but oh my god it's all wood it was built 1903 it could have gone on in smoke mm -hmm. and one of the problems that's a real problem the homeless have been breaking into that building sleeping there breaking windows. I mean, it's been a real, real problem. And so now the school district has been more diligent about keeping an eye on the property, you know, replacing uh, burnt out light bulbs, replacing broken windows, you know, patching the ceiling. But folks, this is a real historic building, a real asset to our community. And we need senior housing. So please, please help us, help us, please. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. And uh, it sounds like uh, that there's a lot of passion and hopefully we can focus that and turn it into action. It's, it's my Mexican blood. <laughs> All right, thank you. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, switch to, let's see if we have any other questions. And, oh, we had a question from Alan LaFaso regarding the Sacramento Bee Building. I looked it up in uh, 1952 is when it was built. And generally, a property has to be 50 years or older in order to be eligible for a listing in the Sacramento Register. So it definitely qualifies. And it would be by far not the oldest, not the youngest building listed in the Sacramento Register. So when we're talking about historic buildings, Theoretically, we're talking about buildings that were built before 1972, although they also have to be significant. In order, in order to be listed, you have to be old enough, you have to be significant, and you have to have integrity. Then you need to look close enough to what you looked like during that period of significance to be eligible. So those are all things to be considered. There was one other question. Has the old Jefferson School been considered for the endangered buildings list? Well, no one, no one suggested it. But it's definitely a building that is sort of in the path. It's also listed in the National Register and the Sacramento Register. And it's also, in a lot of ways, kind of been neglected. And we've only heard rumors. We've asked the developer, Cressley, uh, I think it's Cressley Holmes, who owns that entire half block. And there was some rumors that they wanted to build a 50-story tower adjacent to it and pick up that building and move it over. Don't know how feasible that is. So it's definitely uh, potentially a, a loss or a, a risk. But I did want to move on to the uh, the poll. And now that I've created the survey, let me see if I can actually do this survey <laughs> now that I, I, I went through the trouble to create it. And uh, I'm not sure if we can actually do it. Huh. Okay, we have a we have the survey. Apparently I've done this as a survey rather than a poll. So I'm going to try to create the poll right now. Maybe I should have done it while while George was talking. But I didn't know it was a problem. So I guess we're going to have to, to, to defer this, but considering the fact that there are only eight properties and looking at the size of our, our web page, I think that we can safely say that all eight properties are eligible and all of them will fit 
onto our most endangered buildings. And that because just because the outcry that we've heard, then uh, that the most the most uh, answers that I've heard are that the uh, Marshall School is the most endangered building in Sacramento. Okay, I got a suggestion here that uh, we're, we're going to do it the old-fashioned way that um, you can raise your hands to vote. So we will do it the old-fashioned way. And so what I'd like to ask each of you to do is I will call out the name of a building or the name of the name of a property on this this survey list. And I'd like to uh, actually those of you who have your hands raised, I'd like you to lower your hands. Although, um, and then when I call out the name of the building, raise your hands if you want to see that building saved. No, we'll, we'll, we'll make it quick. Uh, first is the California State Capitol. Okay. And I'm not sure how many, okay. That's, I, okay, that's another question. Do you, do, do, or is, if, I think everyone's gonna raise their hands for every place because they're all important places that we all care about. So I think we're gonna have to defer a vote and I'll see, I, I, I'm not sure how to, how to it's, it, I don't know if anybody who's actually have everybody lower your hands but uh, if anybody who knows how to launch a survey from within a Zoom meeting can raise their hand right now and give me some technical advice, I'd be happy to hear it. Okay. It looks like the, con the the consensus from a few people, and just just from the, the the show of hands for that first item, we're going to put all eight on the page with Marshall School at the top, as I think in terms of it being crisis, in terms of need for active support, it's probably the most important building that needs active protection. But we we can't save them all. But we can certainly try, and we can certainly bring attention to them. And uh, I'm not sure, but I think that the survey that I send out or that, that I that I created will actually show in the browser when the webinar ends. So we're at the end of our program. I'd like to thank you all for attending. And then if the survey appears in your browser window once we depart, then I would like you all to participate and vote. You'll only be able to select one, but please vote if, if that's how it works. New world, new new uh, <laughs> new tools that I'm not entirely skilled in using. So, like I said, uh, my name is William Berg. On behalf of the Preservation Sacramento Board of Directors and our membership, I'd like to thank you all for attending the August 21st Preservation Roundtable. And then our next Preservation Roundtable will actually take place on October 17th, a week before the home tour. And we already have a featured item. We're going to have a panel discussion about adaptive reuse of office buildings. One of the things we're seeing in downtown Sacramento right now, in part, in part because of the shift to telework, is massive vacancies in office buildings. And the question has been asked, how can we convert what had been offices into homes? In some cases, there were buildings that were homes already converted to offices. In other cases, they were built as commercial. But we already know if we can convert warehouses and industrial buildings and canneries to homes, why not an office? So thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great day. And like I said, if the next thing you see is a survey, please take it. Goodbye.